You can be seated. Amen. Well, you can be seated. Uh, my name is Steve Fleshman. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're glad you've joined us for uh, our service today and for uh, this joyous time. I know we got some visitors in the house, and for nearly uh, 2,000 years, believers have been, uh, after they receive Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, they've uh, followed Him in obedience to be baptized and uh, I want to read to you uh, from Acts chapter 2 just now. This is a, a story of the really the very first, uh, many, uh, really one of the first baptisms in the Bible in, in the church age. Many believe that uh, Acts chapter 2 was the beginning of the church on the day of Pentecost. And uh, certainly it was when the, the Holy Spirit came down and uh, indwelled believers. And so let me read to you two verses out of Acts chapter 2. It says... Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And uh, we, we do not have uh, 3,000 to be baptized today, but we do have uh, one young lady uh, but before uh, I ask her to come down, I just wanted to share, uh, my son and I were in Israel uh, around Thanksgiving, and uh, it was like a nine-day uh, uh, tour of Israel that we had, and I think it was day four or day five, we actually got to go to Jerusalem. Uh, we, we went around the country uh, for three or four days, and so it was so exciting to be in Jerusalem, this thing that I've read about my whole life, and to actually go up and see the walls and our very first day I believe it was there was uh, right on the wall it said something about the Tower of David and uh, we all heard of King David and and uh, we were in this courtyard kind of on top of a hill and we were waiting to go into this uh, it was a Catholic church that uh, um, I forget exactly what all we were doing. So as we were waiting in this courtyard, I could see a few of our folks kind of going through into this other area, and we went over there, and uh, <clears throat> uh, Pastor Alan uh, Shelby was out there, so I knew it was kind of safe to venture off a little bit. And there was kind of a, almost like jail uh, bars around this area. And, and I asked Alan, you know, what, what is this area? He said, well, they believe that this is where Peter, uh, this is where the 3,000 were baptized on the day of Pentecost. And, uh, you know, the Jews did not receive Christ as their Messiah. And so it's not really part of the tour. It's just kind of a side attraction. And so we got, took some pictures and, and the area was maybe two or three times this size. And it was deeper in the ground than this. But... Uh, it just made me think of, wow, you know, for 2,000 years we've been doing this. We've been preaching Jesus. People are gladly receiving the word. They're getting saved, and they're wanting to show others that they are saved. And so that's what we're doing uh, here today, nearly 2,000 late, years later. And I'm going to ask Cassie Anderson to come down. And uh, Cassie and her grandmother have been coming to our uh, uh, addiction recovery program on Friday nights and to my knowledge Cassie does not have an addiction but she uh, is desirous to uh, learn how to minister to others and her and her grandmother have been uh, coming and so I just wanted to introduce her to you and uh, let her say a few words if you would Cassie. Good morning everybody I'm so glad that all of you are here today I'm excited to share this with you guys um, I know I'm a new face around here at Heartland Baptist, and I just wanted to say that um, I've been a follower of Christ my whole life, but it was only this past few years at College of the Ozarks that I truly began my personal relationship with him and began um, reading the scripture for myself and deciding what I believed and just um, following him and having a personal relationship with him. and so. As a next obedience in that relationship, I've decided to get baptized and declare him as my Lord and Savior. Amen. So Cassie, do you know if you were to die today, you'd have a home in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ? I do. Amen. Well, Cassie, based on your profession of faith, I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death. 
raised in the likeness of his resurrection. It has been done as the Lord commanded. That's awesome. What a great testimony. Praise God. But welcome again to HBF if you're just joining us. Uh, maybe you've just kind of got come in the building or you're in the overflow room right now or maybe you're just, just joining us on live, on, on live, online. Uh, man, I hope you just didn't get here because you just missed it. That was incredible. Uh, that was a great, a great uh, testimony. So we praise God for Cassie. Thank you for all those that are here this morning that are family and, and celebrating uh, her life in Christ today. That's, that's excellent. What a good testimony. What a great thing to, to come back to. Maybe some of you, how many of you just, just for show of hands, this is the first time, hey buddy, man the kids are doing great. So hopefully we can maintain the calm, right? Even you Elizabeth. So can maintain the calm. She hates it when I point her out like that. So maintain the calm. Uh, so I appreciate the family style ministry. This will be our last week of family style ministry as far as we know. Uh, next week we'll be coming back together and we will, by God's grace, we'll have child care and so I appreciate you coming back. But how many of you, this is the first time you're back in that building? Back, I just kind of, all right, a good number of you. So many of you, most of you have been back. So praise God for that. Well, this morning we're going to be, we're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 28. And our sermon this, this morning is finish strong, finish strong in the ends of the earth. So if you have a Bible, uh, you can turn to, to page, uh, actually we're going to start in Acts chapter 1. So you can turn to Acts chapter 1. If you have one of those Bibles from HBF, you could find that on page 1,449, 1,449. And, uh, and, and uh, as we get into this, I want to just again thank you for being here and joining us this morning. So if you have a Bible, we turn into Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And uh, we've been studying the book of Acts and looking at, you know, really uh, discovering our DNA. And Acts really lays that out. And we're coming to the last chapter. This is the the bookend, right? So we start in Acts chapter 1, and then we're going to end here in Acts chapter 28. And we're looking at the DNA and how God has established His church, how He transitioned it from a Jewish church in Jerusalem. And then we're going to see the Apostle Paul, as we get to the end of chapter 8, make his way to the key city of the earth at that time called Rome. And all of us have heard of Rome, Italy, and we've all heard of Jerusalem. Uh, Rome was the seat of Gentile power. Jerusalem was the seat of, Gent of uh, Jewish power. And now that we've seen this transition, the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9 is saved and, and the primary audience becomes uh, the Gentiles by the end of the book of Acts. And we'll see that in coming weeks. But Paul and his, his uh, crew were on a, on a perilous journey across the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and if you haven't been with us in our study, uh, just kind of to get you up to date, uh, Paul was a, was a, a Jewish Roman uh, apostle. He was preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was not received by the Jews, and frankly, it wasn't always received by the Gentiles. But he was preaching anyway, and uh, because he was he was uh, he of no fault of his own was in uh, Jerusalem and was trying to win the hearts and minds and bring relief to the to the church there. Uh, the Jews did not like his presence and kind of ran him through a kangaroo court, causing him to go through an appellate process which now is on, sending him on an, a journey as a prisoner of the Roman state to, to, uh, to Rome, Italy, to meet with a guy named Nero. Most of us have heard of Nero. Nero, at, at length, is not going to be too fond of Christians. But Paul's going to have a chance to stand before him. And on the way, on this journey, uh, Paul, in the custody of the Romans, uh, is uh, on, a, on, a, on a journey on, a, on a several legs of a, of a voyage across the Mediterranean Sea and runs into very difficult weather. And God uses him, uh, not just as a captive under the Roman Empire. Before it's over, he is like the captain of the ship uh, because God is working through him to direct them to safety. And, and last week we saw a church in the park uh, that, that through that storm and through that voyage, all the thing, everyone was saved, which was an incredible blessing. Uh, all 270 plus people on that ship uh, made it safely to this island that we're going to see this morning called Malita. And so uh, before we get into all of that, I just want to just kind of have you go back and look at the book of Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, because this all started way back in Acts chapter 1. And I want to remind you of, of uh, what Jesus said to his disciples. They were asking him about the kingdom. 
Jesus, when are you going to bring this kingdom? Because as Jews, they were wanting to see Jesus come back physically. Uh, and and uh, he, they believed he died. They believed he was resurrected. Just like Cassie testified just now, that was a message in itself. And they believed that not only that he was alive and that he is resurrected, that he would return and he will rule and reign in Jerusalem. And by the way, that's still on the, that's still on the docket. That's actually going to happen very soon. We have every reason to believe the same thing that they believed. Uh, and, so, uh, and so they were waiting. They're asking Jesus because they didn't have the New Testament epistles. They didn't have the book of Revelation to give them the details of how Daniel's 70th week works out. So they're like, hey, Jesus, um, you know, what's, what's the deal? When's the kingdom coming, man? When are you coming back? When are we going to see this millennial reign that's spoken of in Ezekiel? When, are you gonna, when is that water going to come out of the temple and, and flow and heal the earth and all of those things that, that's written about? And, and how's all that going to happen? And he tells them this in Acts chapter 1 in verse 8. If you have a Bible, uh, we're going to be looking at verses 8 and 9. It says, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they had beheld, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. Heavenly Father, I pray a blessing on the reading and the hearing of your word this morning. And Lord, until you come back, may we be found busy about the business of bringing hope in the midst of a world that is, is really wrecked in many, in many instances. Lord, I pray this morning uh, that the light that we've already seen in the baptism tank, the light of Christ, would continue to shine across our communities. Lord, it would shine across our, our counties. Lord, it would shine across uh, this part of the country. Lord, it would shine across the entire country and across the entire world that this morning as the gospel is being preached all over the planet, Lord, I pray that it would prevail. Lord, Satan is, uh, is wounded. He is hurt. He is going down soon. Your kingdom will return, uh, but Lord, not yet. Lord, and as Satan is flailing, trying to control the things of this earth, Lord, we are free men. We are free, even though we may be held captive, Lord. We are free indeed. And we thank you, Lord, for the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that if there's anyone today under the sound of my voice that is not saved, that is not born again, that is not convinced by the Spirit of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they can be free indeed, that today you would do that work in their heart and release them from the bondage of sin. Lord, help them understand the grace of God and the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ. Lord, Lord, remove from them the shackles of sin and death, Lord, and give them grace and life through Jesus Christ. We thank you and we praise you. We ask this in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. And so this morning, as we look at this text, we see that, that Jesus is saying, guys, I, I, this is what you need to do. I'm going I'm to tell you, you need to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But don't do that yet because you need my power. And that power came in Acts chapter 2 when the Spirit of God came upon them and quickened them and brought them the power they needed to preach the gospel in a way to make a difference across the entire world. And so praise God for that. Uh, and so Paul is now on the other end of this and he has, he has preached the gospel in Jerusalem. He has preached the gospel in Judea. He has preached the gospel in Samaria. He has preached the gospel now in the uttermost parts of the earth. And it just so happens, the last chapter of this, of this book, he lands at an island called Melita. And so in your text in the book of Acts, we turn it back to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. We're going to start this morning in verse 1. Acts chapter 28. And we see that, that Paul finds himself in verse 1. And it says, and, and what? Well, before that... Uh, that conjunction, junction is the function is to connect us with the previous verse. We see in verse 44, chapter 27, and the rest, some, of, some on boards and some on pieces of ship. And so it came that they escaped all safe to land. So everyone that was on Paul's ship that was shipwrecked all landed safely on, this, on the land. Now, what land is that? Well, we see in verse 1, it says, and when they were escaped, then they knew the island was called Melita. So they escaped and found this island called Melita. They escaped a shipwreck, and uh, it was a terrible shipwreck. It destroyed the entire ship, and, but it didn't destroy one soul. And we talked last week how God gets us through the storms of life, right? Uh, there's a warning, a waiting, and man, at the end, there's a winning. And man, they won life by God's grace through this shipwreck. They were able to find their way safe to this island called Melita. Now today, we know that island is called uh, Malta, that's what we call it, just south of Italy. I should have put a map up. I didn't do that. But in, in verse 2, it says, and the, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. 
you know, when, if we're going to finish strong in the ends of the earth, it's going to happen when we, we have hope. You know, this whole episode in the last two chapters, chapters 27 and 28, is really about believing what God says over what you see. We live in a time right now where it's so imperative that we believe what God says over what you see. Everyone's minds and is, are being assaulted right now by media in some way, shape, or form. And everyone's getting messages in. Whether it's, ver- it's audible, it's visual, mainly visual, uh, especially the younger people, they're tuned in all the time to devices. They're just feeding them information all the time. Now Paul, as, as we've seen, he is so focused on what the Lord says that that's all he pays attention to. When the sky is sunny and the breeze is blowing and, and God says it's going to storm, God, Paul says it's going to storm. And guess what? It storms. When, when, when the winds are blowing for 14 days and everybody's starving because they haven't eaten and they're afraid the ship's going to go down and Paul stands up and says, be a good cheer. God told me we're all going to be saved alive. Everybody's like, what? You know what? Paul believed what God said. And you know, we need hope. There is no hope. You're not going to find hope in this world unless you find it in Christ. When the world needed hope, God sent his son, right? When, when this world needs hope, God takes care of it. God is the hope of this world. And his, and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the answer. I know that sounds simple and it sounds like something you learn in the Sunday school, but you're never too old to remember that Jesus is the hope. And so they land on this island. They've been shipwrecked and, and they, need, they, need, they need some hope. And boy, do they find it. These people, when they get on the island, they find that they're on this island. Once they land there, they meet these barbarians. Typically, when you meet barbarians, you don't think of hope. You think of, you know, Conan, right? You think of Arnold Schwarzenegger with the big sword or something, you know? So, no, these guys are so kind. And they, and they realize they're at Melita, which is now Malta is what they call it. And they understand that, you know what, we're not far from our destination. We're not far. So if you're going to finish strong in the ends of the earth, first you need to have hope. That's our first point of study. People who escape death rejoice in hope. I love the way the wording is here. Is here. It says in verse 1, And when they were escaped, escaped. Think about that. Who's escaping? Now, there's prisoners on the ship, but nobody's running. Nobody can't. They can't go anywhere anyway. Malta's a small, small little island. They'd catch them. People aren't escaping from... From, from captivity, they're escaping a storm and desperate situations that would have killed them. They have escaped, well, they've escaped death. They've escaped death. They've escaped death. And when they escape death, man, that's incredible. Who is this that has escaped death? Well, the 276 souls that survived the shipwreck and made it to shore as the Lord had promised through Paul. And what did they escape? Well, they escaped death. And many of us have We've all had close calls. I bet most of us, not maybe not all of us, but most of us have had close calls with death, right? You're about to step out in front of a car, something falls, you know, whatever. I mean, there's just all kinds of, maybe, you, I remember when I was a little kid, a little, little kid took a 22 pistol one time and put it out the window across the street and shot it. Man, the bullet went right between me and his brother, right in the street. I mean, I'm like, man, that was a close call. Then here come the sheriffs, and it was crazy. But anyway, there's all these things that happen in your life, and you're like, whoo, that was a close call. <laughs> I escaped death. And you know, when you escape death, you're thankful. You know, I could, I'm, starting, I'm thinking all these stories. I remember one time we were going down I-70 when I was a little boy. I was like seven years old. My parents had this little Midas pull behind camper on a, on a Cordova car. And uh, we were coming down I-70 there just outside of Columbia. And there's these wind shears coming across the face of the cliffs there. Right as you're getting ready to cross over the Missouri River. Well, it was a beautiful, it was like, it was like Paul's journey to, journey to Malta. I mean, it starts off, it looked really good, it was nice, it didn't look like it was a big deal. And all of a sudden, these winds grab a hold of our car, the, the trailer, you know. And this is before we understood about sway control and all this stuff. And man, we are literally just flying back and forth across the, uh, across the road and uh, uh, jackknifing. And my sisters are screaming. The trailer's like sideways, literally on two wheels, on one wheel on its side like this. And, and we're just, it's pulling us. We're not pulling it. And man, it was craziness. And then my dad reaches over and, and he somehow he puts on the trailer brakes. He let my mom drive. So uh, that was, she never drove an RV again, by the way. Uh, but uh, 
That was her first and last time, I think. Mom's watching, so if I'm wrong about that, correct me, Mom. But, uh, so, you know what? That, you know, we got done. Everybody's crying. I'm crying. My sisters are bawling, screaming. I remember Carrie screaming her head off during this whole thing. Why? Because we thought we were going to die. We thought we were going to be swept off this bridge and, whew, we're gone. Down the Missouri River or something. But by God's grace, it didn't happen. When you escape death, you're, death, you're like, oh, wow, thank you. It provides hope. Hope of what? Hope of life, man. The death that all humanity must be concerned about isn't really that first death. It's not the one that, you know, happens when someone accidentally shoots you with a 22 or your RV gets swept off a bridge on I-70, although that stuff's scary. Uh, the death that we really got to be concerned about is what the Bible calls the second death. The second death. Now, when you think about death, how many of you are just like, yeah, I'm ready for death. Let's just, let's get it on right now today. I'm ready to face death. I think even those of us that are saved, we're accused of not, of being fatalistic. We're not. I mean, even Christians, we're like, you know, God, I'm ready to go, but I'll go when it's time. (laughs) I'm not out looking. I'm not looking today for someone to take my life. Sometimes I preach like I am, but you know, the reality is, is that we cherish life, even the life that we have in these carcasses. But we know as Christians, there's no sting in death. So by faith, we believe. Even though our flesh doesn't want to die, we know our soul's going to be fine. But we have peace. It's not because we don't have peace because we don't have to face physical death. Most of us, unless the rapture comes, which is highly likely, will have to face physical death, right? And even facing physical death, it's a lonely proposition. Nobody can grab your hand and go with you. You got to go alone. It's kind of a scary proposition, even for a Christian, let's be honest. I mean, even though you know there's hope, God has to kind of prepare your heart with grace to get you ready to step over into eternity most of the time. And I've seen that happen. I've seen people go in peace, and I've seen people go in turmoil. And by God's grace, we have peace. And what really causes people to have turmoil about death isn't the first death. It's not taking that last breath. It's what it comes after that. Because you know or you don't know that you have eternal life. And you're going to face the second death or you're going to be free from the sting of the second death. The judgment that's to come. Now there's a judgment for Christians. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. It itself is fearful. That's to give account for the things done in the body, whether it be good or bad. But it has no bearing on eternal life. Eternal life for me, if you're born again, eternal life for you has already begun. So physical death is nothing, in essence. There's no sting in it. I will die someday. I'll get out of this carcass and I'll go, what was I so worried about? This is awesome. I wish I could have got here sooner. Right? But I'm not there now because God wants me to work here right now. Right? And so our perspective changes. We get filled as we get our perspective changes as we get filled with faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God prepares our hearts and our minds to to face death. But you know what? The second death is is really the issue. Because if you you can you can convince yourself that I'll be fine, I'm gonna go to hell and party with all my buddies. How many of you heard that before? Oh, yeah, I mean, they're going to get on the train with Angus Young, take that highway to hell, and have a good time, man. It's going to be fun down there. No, it is not going to be fun. It's going to be terrible. The Bible defines that as the second death. There's two mentions, by the way, of the second death in Revelation 2.11 and Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. We're not going to look at those this morning. But what's interesting in those two references, the first two references of that phrase, second death, they're not punitive. Actually, it's a proclamation of our liberty, our freedom from the second death. Man, how many this morning just know in your heart, man, I'm free from the second death. Man, isn't that awesome? If you just know that in your heart, man, you're just, hey, you can claim Revelation 2.11, Revelation 26. Those are passages talking to people that don't have to deal with the second death. That's what the Bible believing Christian, that's, that's what a born-again Christian is resting in. But the last two mentions of the second death in Revelation are not so rosy. The second to the last is found in Revelation 20 and verse 14. I just covered this this week in my personal time in my Bible, in my daily reading. It says this in verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now this is referring to what happens after what's called the great white throne judgment. What is the great white throne judgment? I'm glad you asked. So if if we don't deal with our sin today while we have air in our lungs and God is convicting our heart, of what it means to be saved. Like Cassie was just giving a testimony. She's like, you know, a couple years ago, I just, I just, I really dealt with this issue and I trusted Christ as my Savior and my Lord and Savior. And I'm, I'm resting in that. And I'm, you know, she's, she's fully persuaded, right? There has to come a time in your life where you really reckon with the reality that the only way to get out into eternal, to have eternal life 
is to receive that by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood and his death on the cross. There's only one way, there's only one truth, and there's one life. And so, and so that, that second death, um, there's, there's a thing called the great white throne judgment. It's for those who have never reckoned with that, who have never really said, you know, I'm going to go to a judgment and I need an advocate. I need a propitiation, as 1 John chapter 2 calls it. I need someone to, to be there to intercede. Not only intercede, Jesus Christ took death on himself for us. So he paid the penalty of death so we would be free. We'd be justified, just as if we'd never sinned. And so those that have never come to Christ and never received the grace of God in that way and have received the gift, we call the gift of eternal life because you don't earn it, you just receive it freely. Those that have never come there, to that place, if they die and face eternity without the hope of Christ... Well, what will happen is they're going to stand at what's called the great white throne judgment. And one of the ways I can liken it is like, so like for me personally, I'm forgiven of my sin because my sin was placed on Christ on the cross. So he's my advocate. He's my, as the Bible calls it, a big word, propitiation. So God looks down at, at, at Brian and he sees Jesus atoning for my sin. He sees Jesus covering my sin. He sees, instead of me, he sees Jesus. And even though I'm not righteous in my flesh... Jesus Christ was completely righteous and his righteousness is imputed or given to me through the death on the cross. So it's a beautiful thing. The day that I trusted Christ as my Savior, God imputed Christ's righteousness to me. So he doesn't see my sin, he sees his son. And I'm covered in the blood. It's a beautiful thing, just like the Passover in the Old Testament. So the death angel passes. But for those that have never received the good news of Christ, the good news is salvation isn't something you work your way into. It's something you receive freely by trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. They will find themselves wanting to escape a death that they can't get out of. And it's not the first death, it's the second death. And they're going to stand at a judgment seat and all the excuses and all the things they've ever used to justify themselves, which is typically like, well, you know, I'm better than that guy, or I'm better than that gal, or at least I didn't do this, or I've been a pretty good person, all those things, we've all done it. They're going to stand before a holy God at what's called a great white throne. And the issue isn't going to be what they've done. The issue is going to be what Jesus did. And why didn't they receive that? And if they want to be judged by their works, then they can be judged by their works. They're all going to fall short of the glory of God. And Revelation 20, verse 14 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And those that are judged guilty, which will be everyone that doesn't know the Lord, will be cast into the lake of fire that burns forever. That's an eternal judgment. That is the second death death. In Revelation 21 and verse 18, there's more information given because it tells us specifically who needs to be concerned today about the second death. Well, it says, but, but, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Whoa, that's pretty heavy. Now, the scary thing, even for Christians, is like, well, I've done some of those things. That's why you must reckon with Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Are you covered in the blood or are you not? And if you're not covered in the blood, I guarantee you, you're going to be given account because there's nobody in the room that hasn't at least thought some of these things, if not done them. Anybody in here never lied? Maybe we have some children, babies in here, little baby cooing, you know. But, I mean, if you're very old at all, I mean, that cookie got stolen out of the cookie jar or something. You know what I'm saying? And you're in trouble. And you need an advocate. I tell you, when, you, when death is upon you, you got to escape. You need an escape. I remember the day that I got saved, man. I, I knew it like I knew it. The Spirit of God was pressing on me. I needed an escape. Man, these people had escaped death. They'd escaped death in the ocean of the Mediterranean Sea, man. But well, it ain't nothing compared to escaping death in the second death. Sometimes God has to take you through some things before you're ready to receive the hope that makes us not ashamed before Almighty God. Now, in Romans chapter 1, listen to this. It says, therefore, being justified by faith. How do you get hold of it? You've got to believe. You've got to believe what Jesus said. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Whew, isn't that good? You're looking for some hope this morning. You can have peace uh, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that's what I want to have. I hope you do too. 
It goes on to say, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation work with patience, and patience experience, experience hope, and hope make it not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now when you get saved, that's another aspect. The Holy Ghost, the Comforter, comes in your hearts. One of the reasons that many Christians, well, all Christians, have peace about, about death and passing into heaven is because we have the Comforter. And he teaches us all things whatsoever he said to us. That's why you can't disconnect a Christian from the Word of God. We find great comfort through the Holy Ghost, through the Word of God. And he goes on to say, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Before you were even born... God had already provided the sacrifice. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, would he, uh, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. It's the total antithesis of everything we see in our culture today. It's loving the unlovable. It's forgiving the unforgivable. It's receiving the grace of God. And so hope makes us thankful. Hope makes us thankful. We rejoice in hope. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God because we're justified by faith. And that means it's not a one-time thing. We repeat it over and over again. Are you Salvation, by the way, let me be clear, is a one-time thing. You get saved and you're secure. But we revisit it. That's what rejoice means. Man, we come together every week to remember what happened 2,000 years ago. Steve did an eloquent job of explaining what happened in the first century, right? And we come together every week and we continue to rejoice and rejoice and rejoice in the hope that guess what? We don't have to worry about the second death. But not only that, we now have the hope of eternal life. We have the Spirit of God and we have the Word of God so we can go tell people the good news. We can be the hope in the story, as I've talked about last week. Are you thankful you're saved this morning? Whew, amen, I am too. Isn't it good to just, just to know that? I am saved today. So we rejoice every Sunday. We rejoice. So if we're joyous today, by next week, we might get a little, we might get a little crusty by next Sunday. So we've got to come back and do this again. We're going to rejoice, and we're going to be excited because Jesus Christ is alive. Hope gives us confidence in God as well. We have hope in difficulty because hope maketh not ashamed. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. And this is a time when people need hope. Let me ask you, do you really have the hope of Christ this morning? I think most of you would say, yeah, I do. Praise God. But do we act like it? I mean, do we live like it? Or do we let the messages come in? Do we let the storms of life distract us from the word of God that says, hey, be of good cheer? Be a good cheer. Do you know, we should rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And that comes with hope, hope in the scripture. So I pray this morning we have confidence that we've been saved from the shipwreck of the eternal lake of fire. Do you know that you've been spared the second death? Now, I know you're in a group of people and that can kind of get kind of freaky. But if the Holy Spirit of God is pressing on you right now and in your heart, you have an uncertainty or questions about that. You need to settle that deep in your heart. I'm not your friend. If, I'm not really here to beat people up. Sometimes it may feel like that. But the reality is here, I, want, I need people to understand the seriousness of the second death. I can tell you right now, I got a message of good cheer. You can escape it. And you can find, you know, Melita is a rock solid island. If you can find yourself in Christ, you're going to be on the rock of Christ. You're going to be saved. So people who give hope receive hope. You know what? The barbarous, the barbarous people, barbarous is not a word, by the way. The bar- barbarous people are inhabitants of this island of Miletus or Malta. Malta is an ancient island inhabited soon after Shem, Ham, and Japheth got off the ark. I mean, this place has been inhabited throughout humanity. Uh, their, their UNESCO has several sites there of ancient temples. The oldest in the world are on this little island in the midst of the, just south of Italy in the Mediterranean, just southeast of Sicily. And, and you know, when you see this word barbarian, when you hear the word bar- barbarian, I mean, don't you guys get, like have an image of a barbarian, you know? 
My mom used to call me a heathen, right? So I had this image until I got saved. I'm like, oh, that's a Gentile. I guess I am a heathen. All right. So anyway, but there's these words, barbarian, heathen, that always kind of, I had these vivid images of, you know, some dude that's just gnarly. You know, so anyway, maybe you don't think like that. That's okay. But Dr. Luke, who's writing this, is being very specific uh, you know, he wasn't writing about Arnold Schwarzenegger and Conan the Barbarian. He was, he was writing about, very specifically, who these people were on this island of Melita. And when you see their behavior, how kind they are, how helpful they are, you don't think of that as a barbarian, right? They're obviously literate. They have, they have housing. So what makes a barbarian a barbarian? Well, I'm glad you asked. That's very important. You see, Malta has been inhabited, by the way, by many peoples throughout the history of the world. But what they're not, and Luke's being very precise here, they're not Jewish and they're not Greek. So the way they would be viewed, Theophilus, who he's writing this letter to, would see these barbarians as an uncultured group of people. But you know what? They're not any different than anybody else. As a matter of fact, they're quite kind. They're quite helpful, and they're quite useful to the kingdom. And God's going to use them in a mighty way. Malta, by the way, didn't get its independence until 1974. It's had various people come in and out throughout the years. 1974, UK gave them up uh, to their own republic. And it's it's a thriving little, one of the smallest nations in the EU. It is the smallest nation in the EU. One of the first countries to regulate uh, Bitcoin currency, too. So there's, it's an interesting little place. But God, God has a plan to bring the hope of the gospel to where? Well, you might have guessed it, the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Now you think, well, Malta's right in the middle of the Mediterranean. That's not the uttermost parts. Well, you know what? It's the beginning of getting there, isn't it? Because those people weren't in the Greek empire. Now, obviously, they were under Roman rule at that time. But their culture and their background was different from the rest of the of the, of the world at that time that was considered educated and enlightened. These were, well, they were barbarians. But the interesting thing, they weren't very barbarous. Half of the great, half of the great commandment was being accomplished. That's more than we can say for the Jews. Right? Love thy neighbor as thyself. When they hit that island, guess what they got? They got love from people that weren't like them. People that weren't educated like them. And you know what? They got taken care of. You know, Jesus intended for the hope of the gospel to get to the ends of the world before the Spirit of God was ever given to the church. In Matthew chapter 28, he said this, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now that power wasn't unleashed until he ascended. We saw it in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And then at the end of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down. That power then filled the church. Once that power came, they were to go ye therefore and teach all nations, not some nations, not the ones that just look like them, not the ones that acted like them, but all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even till the end of the world. Amen. So be it. So God gives this command to those disciples, and it's the same one that he gives in Acts chapter 1, gives a more specific uh, understanding. Go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. God had in his mind... I want to take this gospel to the uttermost. And so, beloved, as a born-again Christian, as a a local New Testament church, if that is not our heart, then we are out of God's will, and it's no wonder there's judgment coming upon the church and the place in which the church is to reach. Why? Because we're to reach people. We're to reach all people. That's what we do. Melita is the uttermost part of the earth because, not of where it's physically located, but who is there. Right, This church has planted a church among those types of people in our own community 50 miles down the highway. Pastor David Pierce. Why? Reaching people in the uttermost part of the earth that happen to be physically located in our proximity. What kind of church does not reach out to the people from around the world that lives in their own community? They can't reach out across cultures when God sent his son out of heaven to cross culture. Now listen to me why this is so important today. Because it is antithetical to everything that is going on in our culture, in the imaging, in the messaging. Everything that you're hearing today says, no, don't cross barriers. Don't love your neighbor. 
as yourself. Don't go to people that don't look like you, act like you, think like you, and love them. But the Bible tells us just the opposite. That's exactly what we're to do. I can remember when I was in my 20s, a missionary named Don Sidebottom was visiting from Ethiopia one day in, in the foyer of our church at Kansas City Baptist Temple, and he says, uh, Hey, Brian, where are you preaching? I was always excited to talk to Don Sidebottom. The fact that he even paused to talk to me was just an honor, honestly. And Don, and I, I said, I'm in Coldwater, Kansas. And he laughs. He's like, oh, brother so-and-so. Went to, I went to college with him. He planted that church. I remember that. And then he says, oh, Brian, that's the end of the earth. <laughs> and I was like, huh? You're in Ethiopia. What are you talking about? Kansas is the... But it really did something in my heart. I was actually encouraged. I'm like, you know what? For me right now, that is the end of the earth. Where's the end of the earth for you? Where are you going that God's calling you? Not, not necessarily geographically, but a people group that's different from you. Someone at school, someone at work, somebody in your neighborhood community that you're willing to reach out and talk to to reach them with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord knows there's a lot of people right now, it's evidently manifest, that don't understand the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Red, yellow, black, and white, they're all precious in His sight. So the local New Testament church, if it's not actively discipling people to literally take the gospel to the ends of the earth, then we are out of God's will. That's all there is to it. It is part of the DNA, and that's why we're studying the book of Acts. It is the book of Acts. Paul has no problems with the Miletan barbarians. As a matter of fact, he's quite fond of them, and they're quite fond of him. And you know what? It's been that way in the church from the first day until now. He's a debtor, he says, to the Gentiles, to the Greeks. There was a time in Paul's life when he was absolutely a racist. If you weren't a Jew, you didn't measure. But man, God changed his heart. God showed him. God showed him what really the love of Christ was all about. He understood the scope and the magnitude of the grace of God. God used the ocean and the Eurachlodon to direct this ship exactly where it needed to go so folks would be exposed to the ministry of the gospel. Maybe today you need hope. Listen to the promise of God. Look at the answer from God and land on the place of the word of God so you can be on the, on the foundation of Christ even today. But you know how this hope came? It came through hospitality. I mean, there was no little kindness. No little kindness. Kindness is point A if you're in an outline. Paul remarks to the kindness of these barbarians. They, they may not have made uh, the Jewish cultural marks that they needed to make. And they certainly, I mean, they probably weren't eating kosher. And I'm sure they weren't as educated as the Greeks. But you know what they were? They were kind. And this is the first mention of the word kindness, by the way, in the New Testament. It's attributed to barbarians. How many of you think, when you think of a barbarian, you, don't, you, don't, you think of Conan, man. You don't think of kindness. Man, wouldn't we... Uh, there's a guy, Erwin Raphael Ma, uh, McManus, that wrote a book, The Barbarian Way. And there's no doubt men need to be unleashed in the church and in the society. Real men need to be unleashed, like Christ. Because men are kind of wimpy today. But the reality is this. What's a, what's a strong man look like? Well, a strong man looks like Christ. He looks like a barbarian. He's kind. He's giving. He's not scared. He's, he's generous. He's gracious. He's, well, he's like Jesus. Again, they had, half the, great, they had half, the, half the great commandment down. They just didn't know the Lord their God yet. And that's why God brought them, a messenger like Paul. Jesus is the personification of love and kindness. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 3, the Bible says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures. Now, Paul is saying this as a Jewish Hebrew of Hebrews. Living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Man, if that is you, let, the, let that sink in. That's foolishness. A lot of what we are letting sink in in our craniums is foolishness. So let's get that out of our minds and go on with it. But, but, conjunction, junction, what's after that? But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared. Titus chapter 3 and verse 4. Think about that. The kindness and love, and the, and the, and love of God, our Savior, appeared toward men. Uh, toward man appeared. The personification of kindness and love appeared. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus came to, the, to his own in kindness, and they despised and rejected him. In Romans 2, 4, the scripture says, it's the goodness of God that, 
leads us to repentance. What really pricks our heart is not the wrath of God, it is the goodness of God. It's the fact that God would save us from his just wrath. And why would anyone want to stand before the great white throne and justify themselves when God has already provided your justification through Jesus Christ? Kindness goes a long way in building relationships. Paul and his 276 were endeared to these barbarians because they showed them a lot of kindness after the, the, the storm. And comfort goes a long way too. They kindled the fire, it says in verse 2. The, they kindled a fire, and it didn't have anything to do with an Amazon account. And so this was, this was help. Some of you will get that later. This was help to them from a cold winter's day. I know it's bad. Wah, wah, wah. But they were in the rain, and it was cold, and man, they just needed a little fire. And there's nothing that will melt a heart like kindness and comfort. And then when you get down to verse 7, we see that they're courteous. There's this guy named Publius. It says, in, in the same quarters were possessions of the chief men of the island, whose name was uh, Publius, who received us and lodged us there three days courteously, he says. Paul is in, introduced to Publius, whose name means popular, and he had, an unnamed, he had unnamed possessions there, that location where the folks had landed. And Publius was also kind enough to take in Paul and Luke and Aristarchus and perhaps Julius into his lodging, and he cared for them three days. And it's noted by Luke. And we see the character of the people was reflected in their leader. You know what? Their leader was kind, and well, so were they. He was courteous, and so were they. It's no wonder that God brought Paul and Miletus, these folks that had these customs that were already halfway to the great commandment. All they needed now was to add Jesus. But you don't add Jesus. Jesus is not an additive. <laughs> he is the full deal. He's the full deal. Because just being good is not enough. You know what? Just being kind and comfortable and just being courteous. Man, there are people today, they're bending over and being courteous, and, but you've got to have Jesus. Because without grace, there is no justice. Without Jesus, there's no justice. You do know, you do know that. Without Jesus, there is no justice. Because he is the only just man. He's the only one qualified to bring justice. And praise God, he doesn't bring it to us. He brings us grace. And because we're not receiving justice, we're, we're seeing justification. Therefore, we give that to others because that's all grace. Are you guys tracking with me this morning? Yeah, that's, that's what the Holy Spirit wants. And you know what? When that happens, we get another thing, which is the third thing on your outline. It's healing. And when Paul was gather, had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man's a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to, to harm. <clears throat> or I'm sorry, vengeance suffereth not to, to live. And he shook off the beast in the fire and felt no harm, the Bible says in verse 6. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they, char they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Well, that's not good. It's good that Paul's alive, but not good that they think he's a god. So there's two people that get healed in this passage in the first 10 verses. The first one is, is Paul in the outline there. Paul's healing. You see that in verses 3 through 6. Paul is returning the favor and serving others, right? He's taking up some sticks. He's thankful for that fire. And boom, this snake grabs him. He shakes it off. And I was just waiting for him to drop dead, you know. This guy's going to drop like a bad habit right now. Boom. And he still keeps going. He still keeps going. And immediately we see that the superstition that was produced, right? Initially, they think he's going to die. He must have gotten karma, right? People today still believe in that. You ever hear that? Ha ha, they laugh, but you know, people really do believe in karma. What comes around goes around. We got all kinds of ways of, say, of saying it. It's common for the culture, because there is a principle, by the way, you do reap what you sow. You plant corn, you get corn, okay? So that is a biblical principle. But in a pagan culture, of course, it's all about demonic super, superstition. Superstitions that supersede what the Bible teaches. Pastor Randy was faced with this in Africa. Many superstitions eclipse even the mind of the Christians. If something bad happens to you. You know, it must be a bad omen, right? A lot of witchcraft, a lot of pagan religion there. Harold Hatman, when he was in Brazil, same thing. Faced the same type of superstitions. Pastor Pradeep, Pastor Rajan, Pastor Ganesh. 
Same thing. But you know what? We even have them here in the United States, don't we? Many cultures are controlled by superstition. In Acts 25, 19, Festus saw Christians as followers of superstition. Some people think what the Bible is is superstition. I'll tell you what, it isn't superstition if it's true. And the Bible's true. So these superstitious people at first are like, oh no, he's going to die. And then the next thing you're like, oh no, he's a god. They're confused because they don't know Christ. Paul shook off the beast, kept going. He was better than Taylor Swift. So God, God miraculously, that was good, you got to admit. And so God miraculously protected Paul. And it's often said that the safest place to be is in the will of God. And that's absolutely true. Even if God doesn't protect you from danger, he often protects us from the impact of danger. Notice Luke records that they change their minds and they will say that even today. There was no repentance because they were not turning to Christ. Oh, you changed my mind. You know what? Changing your mind is great. But what God really needs is a changed heart and a changed life. Changing your mind just meant, well, he went from a guy who should have died to a guy who's a God. That doesn't help him get to heaven. You know what we find here is Paul goes to the uttermost sign gifts that were working for the Jews. When the Jews received a sign gift, man, they're like, praise God! They knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They knew to, knew to who attribute glory to. Today, you look at the Gentile world. Who do we attribute glory to? Men. Michael Jordan, for us old timers. Patrick Mahomes. Oh, these men are awesome! Words that we should reserve for God. I will give you that, Jeff. That's true. They're not awesome. God's awesome. They're men. They're made out of clay. And they're not gods, and we shouldn't worship them. Okay, I like Patrick Mahomes, too. I know I could, I could strike a chord. I loved, I loved watching him play. But the reality is we can't worship. I'm not going to, like, stop what I'm doing on Sunday to give him my undivided attention. All right? Now, that's a personal thing in my life. God's worked that out for years in my heart. When I first got saved, I couldn't say that. My first God saved. If you think, if the praise God, the Chiefs didn't play at ten o'clock in the morning. I'd have never seen church during the football season because I was that conflicted in my heart. But God personally put me in situations where I had to choose the Chiefs over the gospel. And you're like, oh God forbid! I look at that now and it's silly. It's silly, but it's true. God did that work in my heart. I said, Brian, what's really important? The souls down at City Union Mission are skipping out so you can check out the Monday night game or the Sunday night game. And believe it or not, sad to say, that was a conflict in my heart when I was young in the Lord. I believe the Holy Spirit is revealing in this passage how the Gentiles don't receive the benefits of sign gifts like the Jews did. But you know what? That's not the only sign gift that happens. The last sign gift you'll see in the New Testament is found here in Acts 28, and verse 8. It says, And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and a bloody flux. That sounds nasty, doesn't it? To whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him, so that when he was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed. This is the last recorded healing miracle in the New Testament. By 100 AD, these were not happening. Today, if they were, all they literally, they didn't have to pray, they didn't have to have a tent meeting, they didn't have to pack out a, a stadium. They just literally went up, Paul laid hands on people, and boom, they were healed. Just like that. So just like it says. That was a sign gift given to the apostles. By 100 AD, you weren't seeing that anymore. If we could do that today, I'd say go to Children's Mercy. That's your first stop. Start laying on hands right now. But you're not going to find anybody doing that. Now, don't get me wrong. We do pray for people still. We do pray over people. And sometimes God heals them. But we, I can't just roll up on somebody and say, you're healed. I just ask God for mercy. It's up to him what he does. And sometimes he heals. Sometimes he doesn't. But Paul is fulfilling here in, in this passage. It's a bookend to what Jesus wrote in Mark 16, 17. It says, And these signs shall follow after them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Paul did that. They shall, remember the sons of Sceva? They shall, uh, Peter did that. Uh, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, they shall, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, by the time we get to 2 Timothy it wasn't working like that. By five years later, Paul's saying, hey, Timothy, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine off infirmities. Why didn't Paul just lay some hands on Timothy in healing? 
because things were changing. There's some folks down south who want to, you know, handle snakes. <laughs> That's foolish. Because I guarantee you, if you don't die from that venom mistake, that is just the grace of God. Don't tempt God. That's tempting God. Don't do it. Don't go walk out in traffic. Don't do it. <laughs> it's not smart. Dr. Luke describes the, the, the medical condition. He says it's a bloody flux, which is dysentery. His, his intestines were so inflamed that he was passing blood. And Dr. Luke, who was a medical physician, diagnosed that Paul simply laid hands and prayed, and boom, it was healed. You know what we need today? we got lots of technology for physical healing. Man, our culture, DNA uh, sampling and all the things that they can do right now, it's amazing. It's almost scary physically. I wouldn't be surprised if there's not a cure for cancer around the corner. A lot of cancers cured. Some of the cancers that we had around here 20 years ago that were death sentences, now people are living much, much longer. Praise God. Hallelujah. Medical technology, God's given it to us. Use it. But you know what isn't getting fixed very well? Is the hearts of people. And beloved, we are the people that have the solution. We have the hope. We have the kindness. We have the compassion. And man, we need to make sure that we're getting the gospel where it needs to go on time. Well, I've got to finish up. And the last thing I want to say is just look at verse 10 and we'll be done. Who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laid at us with such things as were necessary. So Publius is so thankful that Paul healed his daddy, and so thankful that they got in his providence, put him on this island, that he honored Paul. The honored give honor to the honorable. Publius is the one who saw that Paul was honorable. Interestingly, I told you that he ended up captain, he ended up being the captain of the ship, right? He was captive, and then he becomes the captain. He lands on this island. You don't hear about Julius. You don't hear about anybody else. You hear about Paul because Paul was the honorable man, and he was honored by Publius, the man who was in charge. Luke mentions Publius is honored, but he didn't just honor, uh, he didn't just honor Paul. He, he said us, and this would include Luke and Aristarchus and, and perhaps Julius. And be, what did he do? How did he honor him? It says they laid at us. So they loaded them up with what they needed to continue their voyage. And that reminds us, Philippians 4.19 says, But God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know, honor is something that we can give even if we possess nothing. These children have been very good today. Man, thank you for honoring your parents. You don't have to give anything but obedience, man. If you have nothing to give God, give him your obedience. That honors him. If we honor those things, honor those, I'm sorry, to whom it is due, including lost rulers, God promises to bring blessings of obedience because God blesses obedience, obedient children. Honor, the honor gives honor to the honorable. That's point B as well. Julius is the one there as well that gets honored. Because Paul was an honorable man, because God had his hand on Paul, because Paul brought hope in a hopeless situation, and because many were saved, and because God was using him to preach the gospel on the ends of the earth. You know what was happening? Julius, this Roman centurion who was responsible for the ship and getting Paul where he needs to go, he gets all the supplies that he needs, not necessarily all he wants, all the supplies he needs to make it to Rome, to continue the journey, come from Publius. And God uses people, not even saved people sometimes, to provide the needs for his ministry. And the next thing you know, Julius is being honored because Paul was being honored. And God has provided through Paul for Julius his voyage to Rome. God is blessing him. Why? Because Julius, just a few days before, said, don't kill that man. Don't kill that man. And he saved all those men alive. And when you make good decisions, God blesses it. When you decide to forgive, when you decide to help, when you decide to follow God's word, man, I tell you what, there will be a blessing, there will be an opportunity, and God will bring truth and he'll give you an opportunity to follow him. We have the hope. So we, we can be hospitable. We can be healing, not just of physical needs, but, but spiritual needs. But do we honor God? I pray that we do. Don't allow the storms of life to cause you to miss God's providence in your life. God wants to use the storms to deliver you to people who need to hear the gospel. Today, there are hundreds of thousands of people in our culture crying out for justice, but you know what most of them need? I don't know them all, so I can't speak to everybody. Most of them need justification. They need the justification that comes through Jesus Christ and his shed blood. We have the hope. Will we be hospitable? Will we be healing? 
will we honor God. That's our call. God wants us to finish this church age strong. He wants us to be committed to making disciples and taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, even if the ends of the earth are down the street. He wants us to be like Paul. He wants us to be like Luke. He wants us to be like Aristarchus. He wants us to be like Timothy. He wants us to be like Lois. He wants us to be like Eunice. He wants us to be like these people because what made them unique, what made them honorable was not what they did. It's who lived in them and why they did what they did. And then that makes all the difference in the world. Jesus Christ is the justifier this morning. I pray that you know him. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you that we don't have justice or we would all be cast into the lake of fire. But you brought us justification through the Lord Jesus Christ. You brought us salvation. You brought us grace. You brought us love. You gave us power, love, and a sound mind. Lord, help us to remember that what keeps us from being considered barbarians is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Lord, thank you for giving us the other half to the great commandment, not just to love one another, but to love God first. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for prioritizing Christ in our life. Thank you for prioritizing the one who came to save the world, the one who puts us on that rock and in his providence lands us exactly where we need to be so that we can receive Christ, so that we can go forward in faith, so that we can go and finish the mission of getting to Rome, to the ends of the earth. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity to meet today. I pray a blessing on the reading and the hearing of your word. I thank you and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, if you'd stand with me, maybe you came to this church and you don't know the Lord. I just want to ask you real quick, if you're here this morning, maybe you're watching online, you need to know the Lord Jesus. Hey, don't, don't hesitate to give us a call, 816-380-3033. Maybe this morning you're like, Brian, I need some prayer. I'm going to pray one more time. Anyone need some prayer this morning? Amen. Heavenly Father, I just want to pray for these with hands raised. I pray for those that maybe this morning there's someone that needs to know you as Lord and Savior. I pray today that they would escape the second death. Lord, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice this morning that needs to escape that second death, with heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around. If you say, Brian, that's me, I need to be saved. Anyone at all? Just raise your hand. We'll come to you. Anyone at all? Maybe you're online. You can text us. You can call us. You can email us. We'll get with you. We'll help walk you in the Bible so you can know how you can have eternal life. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for all these that are here this morning. I pray a blessing on the reading of your word. We praise you and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can stay standing. We're going to be dismissed here in just a second. Uh, And so uh, since it's one service, you can go out through the back doors. Remember, there are offering boxes. If you want to give back to the Lord, you can do that. Next week, we'll come back together. And we will have uh, the seats together. So come back and join us. We'll continue through the book of Acts chapter 28. This coming uh, uh, tonight, well, ABFs will be at 6 o'clock if you didn't already have one this morning. And, uh, and then next week, ABFs at 9, church at, at uh, 1030, and then uh, evening service and Wednesday night like we used to do. So it's all going to be back to normal. Social distancing and all of that will be, the checks will be on you. And uh, we may ask you a few questions at the door. But, uh, you know, be responsible, stay in your groups and do all the stuff we're supposed to do. So God bless you. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed.